Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Welcome to the GSMC Travel Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stacey, and I feel like I've said this a lot, but it might be because I host numerous podcasts, so I hope I haven't said it too much on this podcast, but it is summer now when I'm recording, maybe not when you're listening, and it is very hot where I live, very hot, very, I hate summer here, it's so hot, like we, it's just it feels like the majority of summer is spent above 100 i'm not sure if that's actually technically true but my misery makes it feel that way so yeah i'm just not a fan of summer so as i was thinking with the travel podcast which has me imagining myself going different places often with an imaginary lover along with me i was like where can i go to not be so hot so i went to the almost exact opposite place of where that could be which is antarctica uh Antarctica is, you know, it's the southern landmass. It's a continent, but it's mostly ice. It's where the southern pole is located. And it's the southern hemisphere, which means it's, you know, in reverse of us. So when we're in summer, it's in winter, etc. It's actually the fifth largest continent. It's nearly twice the size of Australia, which means it's also roughly nearly twice the size of the U.S. because they're somewhat similar. And it's about 1.3 times the size of Europe. So it's large, but also not the largest amongst continents because there are seven and it's fifth largest. So there's, you know, it's kind of at the bottom. Antarctica on average is the coldest, driest and windiest continent, which is not a surprise. And it actually has the highest average elevation of all the continents, which is a bit of a surprise because it's, you know, of all the continents, not one of the largest and well maybe that makes the average higher but it's not something you think of as oh that's really high really cold sure but oh it's really high hmm it's also a desert with a annual precipitation of about eight inches of rain along the coast and even less than that inland and geographically uh, excuse me geologically it most closely resembles it said the Andes Mountains in South America. And if you listened a few episodes ago, you would know um, that we also went to a place near the Andes, which was also very high. So that kind of that kind of works. I feel like, okay, I'm semi-prepared. I, I wouldn't be because I'm sure I would freeze in Antarctica, but I feel semi-prepared in my imaginary travels to go to Antarctica. So the temperature in Antar- Antarctica has reached minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just insane because A, I'm not even sure that California's reached 128 degrees Fahrenheit without the minus. So you can imagine how cold it must be if freezing is 32 degrees negative 128. Are you, oh my God, how does anything live there? But even at its highest temperature, it's actually not that high, relatively speaking, because the highs in summer along the coast generally range from 41 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm just like, that's that's my winter. And considering that their summer is my winter, I could go from my winter to their summer and not feel too different at all. Antarctica contains about 90% of the world's ice and therefore about 70% of the world's fresh water And if all the ice in Antarctica were melted, sea levels would rise about 200 feet. 
But interestingly, even though this seems like an absolute, almost literal no man's land, there are anywhere from a thousand to five thousand people residing in Antarctica throughout the year at research stations. There are a number of stations often associated with, you know, if not specific countries, it's sort of this is the Russian station, this is the whatever station, um, but they're all for research. There was a period of time where people lived near Antarctica or along the sort of outmost uh, areas of the coast for whaling, uh, but that's not the case anymore. Antarctica is noted as the last region on Earth in recorded history to be discovered, and it was considered unseen until 1820 when the Russian expedition of and I apologize because I'm going to totally butcher these names, Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen and Mikhail Lazarev on Vostok and Mirny cited the Fimble Ice Shelf. Lots of names there, I apologize. The first documented landing at Antarctica was by American John Davis at Hughes Bay near Cape Charles in West Antarctica in 1821, but some historians... Um, don't actually believe that to be the case. And the first confirmed landing is not until 1895, which was by Norwegians, which is kind of interesting because I believe the Norwegians were also the ones who first set foot at the actual South Pole. The first women to step onto the South Pole were Pam Young, Jean Pearson, Lois Jones, Eileen McSeveny, Kay Lindsay, and Terry Tickle in 1969. So a number of years between we first get to Antarctica and then later we first get to the South Pole and then women get there as well. The first person to sail single-handedly to Antarctica, and I have no idea why you'd want to do that, in the same way that I don't understand the people who go to Antarctica in yachts. I'm just like... No, I want the big icebreaker ship. You are not getting me on a tiny, tiny little thing where, you know, ships have been known to, like, get caught in ice. Not going to happen. But the first person to do it single-handedly was David Henry Lewis from New Zealand in 1972. Antarctica is a strange... It's not... It's a continent, but it's not a country. And it is actually considered a de facto condominium and I first got confused. I was like, it's not a condo. I don't understand. It's a condominium in that it's governed by parties to the Antarctic treaty system that have consulting status, and it's not considered the property of any one place. 12 countries signed the treaty in 1959, and 38 have signed it since then, and the treaty prohibits things like military activities and mineral mining, nuclear explosions, nuclear waste disposal, but also supports scientific research and protects Antarctica's uh, ecozone. And the name Antarctica is that it was actually at one point possibly going to be called Australia or Terra Terra Australis, which is like sort of southern land. But when Australia was discovered, it was given that name instead because the discoverer thought there couldn't possibly be any large landmass more south of Australia. So this is clearly the southern land. This is Australia. So when we got to Antarctica and actually discovered it, we gave it the name Antarctica, which is the Romanized version of the Greek compound word Antarctica, um, meaning opposite to the Arctic or opposite to the north, because it is literally opposite of the Arctic. But it's strange to think that it might one have they have been called Australia. I mean, they're both continents, so yes, but also Australia seems like a very warm place, and Antarctica is most clearly not that whatsoever. So yeah, there are, however, ways, even though it seems very far off and hard to get to unless you're like a research scientist, it is possible to actually visit Antarctica without being part of some sort of research team which I will tell you about after we take a short break. So stay tuned. 
you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. the GSMC Travel Podcast, where today we are talking about Antarctica, about the coldest place I can imagine to go at this time, which is summer when I'm recording on this planet. Um, as I was mentioning before the break, there is actually a way to travel to Antarctica as a, you know, a tourist. Um, and that population I mentioned earlier, that 1,000 to 5,000, that varies because of the tourist season. So Antarctica's tourist season covers about five months. Um, basically the Southern Hemisphere summer from about November to March. And so it is greater, quote unquote, greater relatively, you know, the 5,000 more so during the summer and the 1,000 when it is winter down there. The most common way to travel to Antarctica is on a special cruise ship. And I want to call it an icebreaker, but I'm not sure that the actual ship is called that. I feel that might be the historical term for ships that like traveled with ships that were trying to get to the pole or that come and rescue ships that are caught in ice. But I'm not sure the actual cruise ship that people would travel on to Antarctica is called an icebreaker, but it just sounds nice in my head. So icebreakers. The cruise ship trips vary, but are usually between 10 days and three weeks long. Um, But the advantage of the cruises is that everything's provided on the ship and you get to see Antarctica and its wildlife close up for an extended period of time. There are different sizes of cruise ships that you can take from about 45 passengers to about several hundred, 200 I saw, but I think there maybe might be larger than that. The larger ship can be more comfortable and well equipped, but because uh, ships, when they travel to Antarctica, they do still have to be worried about the impact on the local environmental uh, status. You, you're not able to send everybody to shore at once. And so you have to limit, you know, how many people go to shore and how long. And so on a larger ship, because you have to trade off, you don't get to spend as much time on shore, you know, with the wildlife, if that's why you're going to Antarctica. For smaller ships, because there's less people, you do have more opportunity to uh, to engage, but again, it's not as well stocked and comfortable. Um, interestingly, most Antarctic cruises don't actually cross the Antarctic Circle. So you're going to Antarctica, but not to the South Pole, because the Antarctica, if you ever look it up in a map, there is sort of a curving large part and then a stretching out tip. And you can hit that tip, uh, I was going to say somewhat quickly, but I believe the Drake Passage is there. But from going from uh, southern South America, like Chile. So you could go there and be in Antarctica without technically being in the Antarctic Circle. Another way to view Antarctica is by flying. Um, There are sightseeing flights over Antarctica, which allows you to see it. And these can be relatively short, especially compared to the cruise ship. So they're a good option for day trippers who just want to spend a few hours over Antarctica and then get back the same day, which I'm kind of tempted to do as well, because I mean, that's a really cool site. And I'm sure you, there aren't too many people that can say, Oh, I've seen Antarctica like close up. But if you actually do want to set foot in Antarctica, then you would have to do something a little differently. There are flights that do land in Antarctica, but I believe uh, they're somewhat limited There is a fly cruise package, which cuts down on the amount of time you spend on a ship 
and avoids the Drake Passage, which from pretty much every site I saw talking about traveling to Antarctica kept calling like notorious or infamous or it just sounds absolutely terrible even on modern day ships. So that would be nice to avoid that. But these packages still enable you to, you know, get up in close as close as the the cruisers or the cruises or the trips or what have you will allow you with the wildlife on Antarctica. Um, so if you want to get up with the wildlife, but you don't want to be on the cruise ship for the whole time, that might be a good way to do it. Um, I saw it's very interesting because and probably because this is not a typical trip that all the things I've heard about traveling to Antarctica actually sounded not super great. There was a sort of running news story, I can't remember, last year or the year before, about a trip to Antarctica that was kind of stuck in the ice, which is, again, why icebreakers are in my head. But you got the pictures and the uh, messages from the people on board the ship that they were fine. They were actually, you know, kind of enjoying themselves and just very calm and waiting for the ship to come break through the ice and get them out. And I'm just like, I I would definitely be freaking out because, you know, people have died in Antarctica, though, you know, most famously the Scott Expedition, which was trying to get to the South Pole and did not end well, did get there, but did not get there first. And then all the people who actually went to the pole ended up dead. So like my mind would immediately be going to that of like, wait, we're stranded here. That's what happened to them. Yeah, no, you're you're a bit better, you know, set off. You, the technology is definitely improved and people probably have a better idea of where you are and are coming to you. So calm down. But yeah, there is a case of that. Again, there is the Drake Passage. There was a terrible plane crash with a flight from New Zealand into Antarctica but considering that, you know, people have been traveling to Antarctica for a number of years, there actually hasn't been too many terrible stories since, you know, modern day times where we have the better technology to help us. So it's like both good and bad. I'm not super a big fan of penguins, so... I wouldn't necessarily want to go for that, but there is, again, the very few other people can say this of I've been to Antarctica and there is a part of me that does want to see that sort of climate just because it is very hard to imagine. Part of that is I'm from California and not the part where it actually just snows because it does snow here, um, but that's not where I'm from. So it's just like, what? Totally snow ice covered landscape where you can't see anything but snow and ice I I have no idea what that looks like it's only in movies is that real so that would be very interesting but then I again always go to the negative thing so I also host the movie podcast and a few episodes ago we talked about the mountain between us and now I'm just imagining a situation like that when they first get on the mountain where it's just the plane on the snow on the mountain and nothing else around it's like, um, no, let's not. So it's nice to, A, have the more prepared cruise ship, but then B, also have just other people. <laughs> so I would not be freaking out by myself and be like, okay, look, of the, you know, tens and or hundreds of other people on the ship, most aren't freaking out. So calm down. You're good. Like everyone else is calm. You can be calm too. And you probably have a, you know, satellite phone or what have you so you can contact people and because there are these various research stations on Antarctica there are actually there have been people born on Antarctica which is amazing I believe the first person actually born I think it was at at on Antarctica or at the South Pole is actually still alive they were from Chile and there are children with some of these researchers so people feel comfortable enough to bring their families so it's just like okay calm down breathe although I imagine that you know especially with the higher average elevation it would be hard for me at first to get oxygen but after a while I'd be like okay okay I'm good all the people say I'm good history mostly says I'm good technology says I should be pretty good 
I did this once in a lifetime thing. Okay, yeah, that was actually kind of worth it. So we're going to take another short break. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Travel Podcast. Because the country for t- continent, not a country, continent for today is Antarctica, and that is not something you can find, you know, on most travel sites. The site for today is iaato.org, and this is the sort of Antarctica tour operators site. So all reputable cruise operators to Antarctica will be registered with IAATO, which stands for the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. So that's a really good site to check out if you're thinking about traveling to Antarctica. They have, you know, tips and also not quite blog posts, but just things talking about it. But then they also, you know, this is where all the good, all the, I won't say good, I'll go with reputable again, uh, cruise operators will be registered with them. So if you're like, well, I'm hearing about this package. Should I trust it? Go to this site. (laughs) They'll be able to tell you. Um, So they also support environmentally friendly travel to Antarctica. And that's another thing that reputable cruise operators will be conscious of. That's why there's the toss up between larger ships and smaller ships, because we're conscious of the environment and we don't want to damage it so they won't let too many people on at one time you know you're also encouraged you don't take anything from there it's sort of like a a nature reserve or a nature park of you know don't take anything and don't mark anything up this can still be a very uh fragile ecosystem even though there's not relatively speaking as many people coming here um so you don't want to damage it and you don't want to. The wildlife is still pretty unafraid of humans because they haven't had, you know, really any negative in- encounters to learn from. And you obviously want to keep that going for more generations to be able to come and see it. So you, you don't want to behave in any sort of negative way. And so the t- uh, tip for today is to pack smaller items inside of larger items, because otherwise, if you have a hollow item that you can back things in, then you're just sort of taking up space and not doing anything with it. And so I was thinking of this again, because part of my, you know, not quite paranoia, but tendency to freak out about things. And the idea of traveling to Antarctica was just, again, disaster movies, uh, the mountain between us and the Scott expedition, which I really should not have read about before recording this episode, because then that got in my head. So it's just like, okay, if I go, I need to be prepared. And so I would want to probably like septuple check. I don't think that's a word, but at least six times check that I have everything I need and I'm prepared for like every possible bad situation I can think of. And part of that would involve packing properly. And I'm actually kind of terrible at packing just in general. I don't. I get super tired after I'll start off good. And then it's like halfway through. Do I have to fold all my clothes? Really? 
if I just like stuff them in and then step on them, won't that take up all the empty space eventually? Like, does, is it really better to be neat? Because I'm, I'm kind of tired of this. This is, and then I never can pare down well enough. I'm pretty good usually with the, the weight limits because I have a, a scale that you can take with you. But I will definitely overload my carry-on, which I know now some airlines are like, also, you can't do that with your carry-on. But there was one time when I had to fly pretty much all my stuff. And after the clothes were in there, things just sort of got put in haphazardly. It was just sort of like, uh, this can go in this suitcase, this can go in this suitcase. I don't care. I'm tired of packing. Packing is terrible. It sucks. But I think it would have probably been good if I had, you know, A, a system, and B, the patience to follow that system, but then C, a very good way of making use as much as possible of all the space in the suitcase, because I think then I could have. I had to actually um, borrow suitcases. (laughs) Thankfully, they were my family, so, you know. The, it, the person wasn't going to miss them anytime soon and they knew who I was, but I did have to sort of borrow suitcases and my mother was traveling with me. So she, when she went back, her entire checked bag, I think was like a suitcase inside a suitcase inside a suitcase. And there was just stuff in her carry on. And I was like, I love you. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I would, I would definitely need a better packing system. And I like this idea of putting things in other things, although then I'm worried about, the the way they do checked bags because at one point I put a water bottle in a checked bag and it wasn't it didn't have water in it but it was a metal water bottle and I guess it I think that's why they opened it all I saw was a letter that they you know opened it and checked through it and I took a guess that it was probably off of the metal water bottle and the way it came up through the scanner but that does then make me worried of how will things come up in scanners and will they think, you know, I have something dangerous in my bag when I don't, but then they can just open it and see that I don't. But yeah, so more space, but possibly, I mean, I've never had too bad of a problem with checking my luggage and them being able to check my luggage and see that it's safe. I have once or twice freaked out because I thought they lost my luggage and it somehow just didn't show up on the carousel with everybody else's. And so I like went to go file a claim and then it showed up like by the time I was finishing that almost an hour later. And I'm like, where did you put that? That it's just not showing up. Did you think it was going to a different flight? Like did this nearly go to a totally different state? Where was my luggage for this whole time that it's just now showing up? But thankfully I've never actually lost any luggage knock on wood, because now, of course, now that I've said that, gosh darn it. So anyways, yes, that is the tip for today. And the site is iaato.org for the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. So that's it for today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Travel Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From travel to health and wellness to entertainment and life and happiness to sex and relationships. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you. And we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast.